off the worship with a song called Breathless Love. This is one we just started learning, and it has a really, really great message. And it's done by, or created and arranged by Corey Asbury, Caleb Culver, and Rand Jackson.
Hey guys, welcome back to Pascal's Place and um, Happy New Year still. I know we started our new year last week and um, I hope you guys had a good week. Um, I'm back in Bible school classes so um, and back at school so kind of hit the ground running this week and um, it's been crazy. So, but we're going to continue where we left off last week and last week we talked about Moses and the Red Sea which is one of my favorite stories. I really love the story of Moses and uh, I think the whole the Red Sea story is amazing, um, including where the chariots, the Egyptian chariots, followed them into the sea, and the Lord just delivered them. And as they're walking in the desert, they always have a pillar of fire before them at night or a cloud in the daytime, always to guide them, which I think is symbolic that God wants to be our guide. He's trying to lead us if we'll just look up and follow him. And so I think that's really important. But we also talked about how um, already the Israelites were starting in with their grumbling and their um, complaining. And even after going through, even after leaving Egypt and seeing the 10 plagues and being delivered um, and taking a lot of the riches of Egypt with them, given to them by the Egyptians, even though they got out the, to the desert and when they saw the Egyptians coming, they were already scared, they were already worried, they were already complaining. And if you'll remember, they were like, Moses, why did you bring us out here to kill us? You should have just left us back in Egypt. And it's like, really? After all that, after the Passover lamb, after the blood on the door, and we talked about all the comparisons between um, that deliverance into the deliverance that Jesus offers us today, and so many comparisons between Moses and Jesus. It's like a, the foreshadowing that the deliverer is coming. And so, but in the meantime, we find the um, Hebrews out in the desert trying to live their life, and already they run out of food. And so um, they're already complaining again, and they go to Moses and like, Moses, we're starving. Why didn't we stay in Egypt where we could have had food to eat and make bread whenever we wanted? And we're starving. Why did you bring us out here? You should have just left us in Egypt. They said that like over and over always complaining, and, um, and he said, God's going to deliver us, and, and so God says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give you manna from heaven, and this is a really interesting, interesting story that he provided them manna from the sky, and it came like dew on the ground, and it was absolutely a miraculous thing that he fed these people in the desert. And so, um, and it was so miraculous, and people say, well, what was that that they were eating? Some special flour or something? It really was miraculous, and we know that because he said on this, the day before the Sabbath, you gather twice as much. And he said, you don't need to gather too much. You always need to just gather enough. But on the day before the Sabbath, I want you to completely rest on the Sabbath. So you go draft, gather twice as much on that day and it won't rot or spoil. But on any other day, if you gather too much, it will be filled with maggots and worms. So it's a very interesting story. And, I, and you think, well, why would God do that? Why couldn't they just gather all they want, put it in something and store it? And, and I know that the reason was, is he is trying to teach them to trust him because that is where they're lacking. All the mir miracles, all the things they went through, he is trying to teach them to trust him. And to go and just gather enough for the next day, that's an act of trust. Because it's like God will provide in the next day. God will provide the next day. And then on the Sabbath day, the day before the Sabbath, you gather twice as much so you can rest on the Sabbath. God will provide. And if you think about, um, Jesus tells us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's kind of like he's saying, we, we trust you to provide for us. And one of the reasons we pray at the dinner table, it's not because God's up there expecting us to pray for the food. It's our acknowledgement that, thank you, God, that you provide us our daily bread. And we trust you to provide us our daily bread. And that's, it's an act of trust that he gives us the, the means to work, to, to make money, and... Um, and when we follow Jesus and when we serve him, he provides for us. And it's amazing on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes right in the, in the middle of he'll come coming through. But he allows us to be tested. And that's what he was doing with these people. He's testing them. 
All right, people, I brought you through Egypt. I brought you through the Red Sea, which is pretty big. And now I'm going to feed you from my own hand. And I, and I want you to trust me. And then there was a time, not long after that, about that time, when they ran out of water. And the same thing happened. They were like, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. And um, they were just complaining a lot. I remember when my kids were little, Frank Peretti had that great, was it a CD that you listened to? It was like an illustrated Bible and it had a CD that he read the story. Yes, they had this great Frank Peretti illustrated Bible and it had a little CD. And Frank Peretti is one of my favorite authors. He wrote This Present Darkness, Piercing the Darkness, all these different, The Oath, Monster, some really cool books. And um, he does a lot of work for kids, and my kids were really impacted by his stories. And he does a great job of telling the story about um, the Hebrews always complaining and always moaning about what's wrong with them. But, but then God said to Moses, if you'll just strike this rock, water will come from the rock. And it's interesting that Moses um, just does it. He's just obedient. And he's always telling the people, just calm down. God's going to deliver us. And he strikes the rock, and the water comes from the rock. And again, um, the people are rescued, but he's trying to, he's allowed, he allowed them to get thirsty so that he would see if they would trust him. And I think God is doing that for us too. He allows us to go through rough things, not because he's trying to hurt us, but he's trying to say, are you going to trust me? Um, or are you just going to lean on your own abilities or whatever? And I know I'm, I'm walking through that right now. Are you going to trust me? Or are you going to try to work it out on your own? And something I struggle with myself. So I, I'm not um, belittling these people. I just, um, I think it's really easy to fall into that trap of, of forgetting what God has done for us. Just forgetting it. And, um, and that's, we just got to get in the habit of reminding ourselves what God has done. So during this time, Jethro, who is um, Moses' father-in-law, brings his wife and children to visit him, to see him, to bring him to them. So it's interesting, before Moses ever went to Egypt, he knew he was in danger, so he provided safety for his wife and sons and left them with Jethro, his father-in-law. And so they hadn't seen him all this time. So um, this is about two months since they've been delivered. So they were probably gone from him for several months. It took him several months to go through that, to get to Egypt, then to go through all the um, talking to Pharaoh and all the plagues and all. That's been quite a while. I don't know how long. But he brings um, the wife and the sons back. And, and just... Hey, so we have a little technical difficulties in that last, um, our recorded session right here. So I had to fill in a really important spot that the camera lost, so I do have a different shirt, and I'm jumping in, and then hopefully it'll click back to the right place, but um, just wanted to fill in the spot that the camera lost. So we were talking about Jethro and how um, Jethro, um, Moses' father-in-law, had the boys and um, Moses' wife, and he was bringing them to them, and um, while he's visiting, Jethro um, tells Moses, he sees that Moses is standing in judgment all day long, listening to cases from these thousands of people all day long. Moses is listening to case after case. And some really, um, Jethro offers him some very good advice. And he says, Moses, you need to delegate. You cannot sit here all day long. You, too many cases, too many things. You need to delegate your um, leadership out to these people. And so it says specifically in the Bible that uh, Moses then, taking advice from his father-in-law, delegated um, one guy over a thousand people, one guy over a hundred, a guy over fifty, and a guy over ten, and that they would hear cases, and that was a tremendous help for the leadership of these people. And and God is then provided someone with some good advice from Moses because Moses has another job to do, and so in the in the meantime, Moses. God is preparing these people to be his children, to be the set-apart ones. So he brings Moses up onto Mount Sinai, which we talked a little bit about that last time. And he's going to give him the Ten Commandments, the law, which is actually human rights. The first, ten, first of the commandments are about how we should treat God. 
And the last of the two commandments are how we should treat people. And so the human rights come from God. Without God, we have no human rights. That's where we learn it from. So um, he sets out the Ten Commandments. And so we start from the beginning, and God is writing these with his own finger, writing down the law for these people to be his covenant people, to be able to eventually bring the Christ to these people. Um, and the first one he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that one's very important. We don't, we do not mess around with God. He is number one. He's the creator. He's our creator. He's the lover of our soul. So he doesn't want any other gods before him. And he has to tell that to these people because they live amongst polygamists, not polygamists, but um, polytheists. They live among polygamists also. But polytheists worshiping multiple gods. And he says, no, I'm the God. I'm the only one. You can't have any other gods. So that's one. So that's about how do we treat God. We honor him as the most important. And then the second one says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. And ironically, all these people that surrounded um, the people of Israel had gods that they made by their own hands and worshipped them. Which seems strange that you would worship something that you yourself made rather than worship the creator who made you. So that seems like a no-brainer, but all of these people that surrounded the Hebrews, and then again the Hebrews themselves, um, worshiping idols that they made. Now today, people worship idols that are made by other things, maybe not necessarily by their own hands, but definitely people have their own idols today. Idols could be money, popularity, what up, whatever, but these idols that are made by man also then become gods to people, and they forget about the creator and start serving these other things made by man. So there are many man-made things that people today still worship and forget about God, their creator. And the, and the Ten Commandments specifically says, you can't do that and please me. If you want to please me, I have to be your God. You can't make an idol. I'm it. And then he also says, this is really important, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now this one is terribly um, misused today. So many people use the Lord's name in vain without even thinking of it. Without even thinking about what they're doing, they're using the Lord's name in vain. Um, movies coming out, made for teenagers and kids, even um, if it's PG-13, it'll have the Lord's name in vain multiple times. Some even PG movies now are adding the Lord's name in vain to just be PG. And so they're not, Hollywood is not afraid of misusing the Lord's name in vain to the point that now kids think it's very normal to use the Lord's name in vain normally. They don't even think it's anything wrong. They don't even think they're doing anything wrong because our society has so misused the name of God that they don't even, people are even unaware of it. They don't really realize that when they use the Lord's name Rather than in prayer, but in some vain way, they are just offending the creator of the universe. And you don't do that. You don't do that. And we, are, and we get mad and messed up that our society is messed up, and yet we fail to teach our own children these important things. And then we get mad at them when they behave poorly. And so we really have a job to do when it comes to honoring the creator of the universe. And... Um, God doesn't mess around with that. He said, do not misuse my name. Do not do it. And that's something our society needs to take a look at and really look at ourselves. The next one is um, observe the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, the Sabbath is not made just so we can sit around worshiping God. It's not about God. The Sabbath is about us. Even God, after creating the universe, the reason we have a day of rest is because he rested after creating the universe and just enjoy his creation. He rested. And if you've ever worked a job that did not allow you to have a day off, it is hard. You get tired. You lose your efficiency. You get worn down. 
And I've, I've had that situation where it wasn't even that hard of a job, and just not having a day off is just wearing. When God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, he's, he's saying, honor me, but he's also saying, I give you this day because you need to rest. And so many people ignore that. And, and we really would do better if we would all just take a retreat and a rest day. It, we'd be better at everything. But we're forgetting about that. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Take a day of rest. And then the next commandments, those are the first four. Then the next are about people. And the Bible clearly says, number five, honor your father and mother. So you should have a long life. And things will go well for you. And, you know, you don't have to agree with your father and mother on everything. Sometimes maybe they're not even in a healthy place. But the Bible clearly says you must show them respect. And that is really important. You know, fortunately, I have parents who are very worthy of respect, so it was not difficult for me to do that. But even if you don't have parents that um, nobody's perfect, for example, you still need to show them respect. And the Bible clearly says, show your parents respect. And, and we don't do enough of that anymore. It's another thing that's being lost. We have lost the ability to show respect. Well, and it comes from God. People who don't respect God often can't respect many other people. It's hard for them because they don't understand the order. And clearly God is in charge. And there are so many people that are like their own God, so they don't understand the order at all. But God is saying, honor your father and mother. And then the next one is uh, obvious. You shall not murder. Again, human rights comes from the Bible. You shall not murder. That's different than kill. The word used in the, in the ancient original um, language means murder, not kill. Um, the Bible clearly allows for self-defense. It clearly allows for people who are defending themselves in a war situation. It clearly allows for some things. It even creates cities of refuge for people who accidentally murder someone. But it clearly values human life. And, there, and, and we know that because in the first murder, um, God says to, to Cain, your brother's blood cries up to me from the ground. So clearly innocent blood is, is never acceptable to God. And there will be a payment for that. Even though we don't see it always, there will be recompense for innocent blood. And so the Bible says you can't go around murdering people. You can't. And, and most laws in most countries support that. Not all, but most laws support that, the value of human life to some degree. Some nations don't value human life very much, and it's very obvious by the way they treat people. Our nation the greatest of all nations, although not perfect, values human life. So um, that's another reason that many of us are against abortion. We value human life. And so we defend that through the Bible. Um, also, the next one is commit adultery. You must not commit adultery. And this is the one that really talks about the importance of um, faithfulness in relationships. And it sh clearly shows that the Bible values the institution of marriage that we be faithful. And so it's clearly saying you cannot be in a marriage relationship and be unfaithful to that and please God. And so he, he's definitely supporting the institution of marriage as being faithful to the person you're with. And it also has with that the support of faithfulness in relationships that we all know what it's like to be betrayed by someone, betrayed by a friend, betrayed. Um, that is, is like a terrible thing for someone to be betrayed, the importance of relationships. Um, I talked to some kids about um, this, this week about faithfulness of friendship. And they talked about how they'd all been hurt by people they considered their friends. And I was like, that's really, everybody's been betrayed by someone they consider a friend, which is, it's something we universally all share. And, and God is saying, don't do that. Be faithful to people. Be kind to them. Um, and the next one is, you must not steal. It's like you can't take things from other people. That's harmful to people. 
You can't do that. I'm telling you, no. And again, we have the human rights coming straight from God. You know, and all a lot of people today criticize, oh, the Bible is just this judgmental book and it's just te tearing everything apart. And it's the exact opposite. The Bible is where we get our human rights. The Bible teaches us how to treat people. And I know I've told you before that um, the study of emotional intelligence, all the abilities of emotional intelligence are actually taught right in the Bible. I don't even know if Daniel Goldman, the guy who came up with it, knows that. But he's just basically copied the whole Bible. He, he doesn't even know maybe, but he did. Character development, Bible. First, the first development, God. Developing the human character, social interaction, how to treat each other. Um, you're not supposed to lie. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. And what that shows is that your word the things that come out of your mouth are very important. So if, you, if you've ever been lied to, which all of us have, it is like the worst thing. Is it not the worst thing? Because it alters your reality. Lying is terrible. Because when, if you believe it, your, your reality is altered. Every criminal that ever lived works out of lies. They deceive. They convince people of things that aren't true. And the Bible itself is, it says that lying is Satan's language. That is the language he speaks. All lies come from Satan. That is the, he, he is the father of lies. That's what the Bible says. He is the one who invented lies. He is the master deceiver. He'll tell you anything you want to hear to take you to hell. Anything. He'll tell you anything if it'll take you away from God. He will, he will tell you anything you want to hear if it'll take you away from God. Really important. And that's why God's saying here, do not lie. That is a major thing. I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened to me in my life, but one of the worst things is when people deceived and lied to you, right? Would you agree that is major? Because you like thought there, you come to find out there's somebody they weren't even who that you thought they were. It's all fake. Often to get something for themselves. Lies are always about selfishness to get something from somebody else. And um, the last one is you must not covet. Wow, that is hard in our society because everybody's looking at it and thinking, oh, I wish I had that car. I wish I had that house. I wish I had. I remember growing up, my mom, so funny about this. We drive by and I saw she go, I wish I had that house and they had a better one. Because <laughs> that, it takes out the vindictiveness of coveting, you know, it's like, I wish I had their life or their house or their looks or, uh, so when she said that, oh, I wish I had the house and they had a better one, she's wishing them well and complimenting the house. I just, I just always laughed about that. I still say it once in a while. I wish I had the house and they had a better one. So, um, but we live in a constant torment if we're always coveting. I mean, the world of comparison, there's nothing that can make you more unhappy than comparing yourself to other people and what they have, right? I mean, we could all say, I wish I had this, I wish I had that. I'll be happy if I have this, I'll be happy when I have that. Ah, that's a never ending vicious cycle of insanity, right? And the opposite of that is to be happy with what God gave us, to be content. And they've done a lot of studies on contentment and happiness, and they found out that people who are gra have gratitude are the happiest people on earth. People that are grateful for what they have are really like the happiest, most content people on, on earth. And that's why the Bible's like, count your blessings, remember what I've given you. And it's an exercise, and I'm not so good at it. I get off track. And I have to say, okay, be gracious, count your blessings, think about what God has given you. And um, I have a song called um, Grateful that maybe we'll do next time. But um, it just, I remember I was having one of those pity party days where I was just going um, down the road and I was just like, I ride a lot in my car when I'm going on long trips. And I was just like, my life is terrible. And mine, mine, mine. And I was, and I was having some legit problems. I was just driving down the road just thinking about how terrible everything was. And, and then the Holy Spirit reminded me, count your blessings. 
Look at the things you have. And then I started counting my blessings. You know, I have great family members. I, I was raised in a Christian home. I have a, a husband who loves me. I have beautiful kids. I play music. I love playing music. I, I even have horses. How many people have horses? God's given me horses. I was like, that's awesome, right? And I, you know what? I became so overwhelmed that I had to pull over and cry, just weep, because I was like, I'm so stupid, and that was really ridiculous, and what a crybaby, and I was just so overwhelmed with all that I had that just to practice I, to gratitude, to be thankful for the things that you have. But it's like exercises, because the more you need to do it, the more you don't want to. So when you're having a bad day and things are going bad, you really don't want to be grateful. You really don't want to count your blessings. It's like, stop. I'm not going to do that. But once you start it, just like an exercise program, once you start it, you start to feel better. So once you start being grateful, start being content with what you have, then you start to feel better. And sometimes it takes a lot of personal integrity to be able to tell yourself, okay, let's just calm down and count the blessings. And I'm speaking this to myself, okay? I'm not preaching to you. I'm talking to myself right now. So, um, but that song, Grateful, came out of that moment of when I pulled over and cried and just said, I'm sorry, God, I really have blown it. And thank you for everything you've given me. Thank you for my life, my breath, my friends, my family, things I don't deserve that you've given me above and beyond my capacity to even believe it. Thank you. And so um, when he says, thou shalt not covet, he's saying, don't be looking at people. Just trust me. Trust me. And like I said, the Liberating Law by Gerard Reed talks about how these things are so freeing when you come into the grace of God to be able to trust him and not to look at your neighbors and not to constantly say, I'll be happy when. I mean, haven't we all done that? I'll be happy when. I finish my degree. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I have a friend who's really mean. You know, we do this game that we play. I'll be happy when, you know, and it's it's just it's causes us to never be happy, honestly. And so um, he also brings up the fact that the Ten Commandments actually bring a moral stability to a, a, a society that actually keeps us from poverty. So if you, um, poverty, moral poverty leads us to actual poverty. And I'm definitely not saying that poor people are evil. I don't believe that at all. But it's the moral poverty that where people are scamming other people. People are stealing. People are not um, um, rewarding the people that work hard for them. That people are taking where they should be giving. It's, it's not, poor people are not evil. But poor Poverty is sometimes based on the fact that a society is broken down and it's messed up because people steal and people take and people covet and their people are greedy. And so therefore we have a broken society and our society is one of the best in the world. It really is. But when we have trouble and we have messed up things, it's because there's moral depravity. There's moral poverty. People don't care about other people. They aren't doing good things. Or they refuse to contribute to society that needs everybody to help out what they can. And they refuse to give to the people that can't help us. So we have a broken society. Um, there's, a, there's a cool guy, Kyle got me onto this guy, Ben Shapiro. He's not a Christian, he's a Jew. I love the guy. He's so, much, so many good things to say. Talks about poverty. I mean, obviously Ben Shapiro is a Jew. He believes in the Ten Commandments. He believes in a society that has rules and limits, and out of those limits come our freedom. And he is definitely a patriot. Ben Shapiro is a patriot. And he talks about how if you want to stay out of poverty, statistics say do three things. Say finish high school, get a job, and don't have kids till you're married. Statistically speaking, Ben Shapiro says if you will do those three things, you will not be in poverty. Interesting. So, and, and those three things kind of support our Ten Commandments, don't they? That we work, that we contribute, that we think about other people, that we, um, that we wait for a relationship that can support kids, 
before having them? You know, heaven forbid, did I say that out loud, okay? Somebody might call me and call me by names, but I'm just saying, God said it, I didn't make it up, okay? It's the Bible, okay? Go to the Bible. And nowadays, we live in a, in a place where you're not allowed to hang up the Ten Commandments in a public place now, in many places. You can't hang up the Ten Commandments. We have them hung up here, just want you to know that. But you can't hang up the Ten Commandments. I've tried to figure this out. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. You know what? You can't hang them up in public school. Did you know that? You know what? Wouldn't it be terrible if all of a sudden the kids in public school started obeying the Ten Commandments? Oh my goodness! It would be a lot different walking down the hallway, wouldn't it? There definitely wouldn't be any more school shootings, right? The Ten Commandments. And people are now afraid of them. Oh, put that away. We don't want to hear the Ten Commandments. That's old school. That's old school. Don't bring your Ten Commandments around here. This is a public place. I mean, it's ridiculous. It really has become pathetically ridiculous that we can't hold up the rules that God gave us, right? And God knows, and, the, and, and to finish this out, God is a God of justice, but he is also a God of love. And he gave those commandments to us out of love. But none of us are perfect. We've all broken commandments. We've all broken them. Which is why God sent Jesus as our Redeemer. Because really, without the Holy Spirit and Jesus to guide us, we can't, we break the Ten Commandments. I mean, we try not to, but without His help to empower us and lead us, we're just Ten Commandment breakers, right? All of us, right? We just break law breakers, right? But Jesus came because we can't redeem ourselves. And he became the perfect lamb, which we talked about last time. He became the sacrificial lamb to take our sin. Because God does not mess around with sin. God is so holy that he can't coexist with sin. And so in order for us to be drawn to him, our sin has to be cleansed. Now the Hebrews had to give sacrifices for their sin. And it's not that God hated animals, but he wanted to remind the people... Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. Some sins have more consequences than others. We all know that, right? Stealing has a different consequence than coveting, which definitely has a different consequence than murder, right? But it's all sin. So, he's, so God gives us these Ten Commandments as a guideline, but he says, I love you. And I could judge you all by these Ten Commandments and send all of you to hell. I could because I'm a holy God, but I love you. And instead, I've offered you my son as your savior so that you can enter into a covenant with me. You can enter into a covenant with me. And I can forgive your sins. I, that's just amazing. I, I think it's kind of unbelievable. I think, that, I think that there are so many people that aren't really Christians because they don't really believe that God really will forgive them. And they're just kind of like, I don't know. But you're wrong. God came to earth in the form of man to forgive you. That was his total focus. And if people think that, that churches and Christians are out there trying to condemn people, then they're all wrong. And if people, if Christians and churches are out there condemning people, then they've missed the boat. Our job is to reach people, to reach people for Jesus Christ, to extend the hand and pick them back into the ship. You know, Jesus called, when he called his disciples, he said to them, he didn't say, I'm going to make you priests in the synagogue. He didn't say that. What did he say? I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. Jesus came with the sole purpose of winning people to God. Isn't that awesome? He didn't say, I will set you up in the synagogue and you will be pious and mighty and you will uphold my law. No, he said, I will make you fishers of men and you're going to go out and tell people that I want 
to have a relationship with every living human being on earth and all they got to do is say yes and he's like here I just offer it tell them the truth Jesus wants to forgive you there is nothing you've ever done that Jesus can't forgive and doesn't want to forgive and doesn't want to be in covenant with you and that is the most amazing news ever right and, and you know, that's, that's why I've been called to do this. You know, there's a lot of things that I could do with my life. I play music, I write music, I'm an educator, but I just can't stop thinking about the people that need Christ. I just can't stop thinking about it. It just, I wake up thinking, how can we get more people to, to know that Jesus loves them? Not so that they'll behave and be perfect and pious, but to know that Jesus loves them and that he wants a relationship with them. And so, like I challenged you last year, or last week, for this new year, stop worrying about what people think. Start serving God. Just trust yourself. Make a covenant with him. And start serving Jesus, because his plan is way better than yours. And if you're looking for fulfillment, you'll never get it in this world. Try it. You'll never get it. But fulfillment comes when you embrace the image of Christ and take on him. And... He's just like, I'm so here to love you. I mean, honestly, the message from God is, I'm here to love you. It's not, I'm here to squish you because you did bad things. I'm not here to spank you because you're evil. I'm here to love you. That's God's message. That's God's message. Let's pray. And then I'm going to have, we'll go sing one more worship song before we go home tonight. And um, But let's pray. To Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you're so amazing. And I forgive me for the days that I feel like comparing myself to other people. And forgive me for the days that I'm not grateful because I am just so, so glad that I've embraced a relationship with you, that I, I just want to be like you more every day. I just want other people to get on board with me and find the fulfillment in Jesus Christ that he offers to all of us. And God, most of all, I just want to thank you that you love us, help us, be able to bring that love to other people. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll sing one last song, and then we'll come and hang out with everybody and see every people. Every people. Is that, is that, is that a real way? <laughs> every people.
never fails, it never gives up, never runs out.